Cyber Safety Champions of the World Unite. Hello and welcome to Cyber Day. Thank you to all of you for making this annual event such a success. This year is has been bigger than every other year before. And so we've been multiplying our uh, attendance each and every year. This is fantastic. As a reward to anybody and to everybody, my team and I have put together this awesome presentation. I hope you enjoy it. As you may or may not know, cyber safety is a rule-based order. And so I've managed to bring together the 10 rules of cyber safety for you. These are for your digestion, they're for your consumption, and they're also for you to share. So as I go through these very quickly, make sure that you think about how you're going to then turn around and share them with your network. So enjoy grokking these rules. They are awesome. They're super simple. They uh, obviously can each constitute any amount of discussion, any amount of um, presentation, and they can be presented in any context, and they can be uh, refreshingly referred to in any way you can. By all means, use our hashtags, use our uh, screenshots, and be sure to share these insights because it's important. It's an important initiative, not just here in Canada, but everywhere else at this time. So without further ado, rule number one of Claudius rules of cyber safety is to be intolerant to practically all of the pop-ups that come onto your screen, and that includes ads. Advertising is a, a medium that allows any number of companies to pay in order to get in front of you. And unfortunately, when that happens, there's a lot of tracking. There's a serious and a real risk of violation of our privacy rights, which of course are your human rights. They're everyone's human rights. And what's more, in many cases, cyber criminals target those advertising servers to infect them with malware and push them onto your screen. Luckily, there's something you can do. You can block ads. You can block ads depending on your level of technical competence or your IT department or your school. It's relatively easy to block ads. You can use um, a browser, a web browser that blocks them, or you can block them from your internet router, or you can identify them on your screen and block them. Uh, there are even browsers that are built into ad blockers. So let's all avoid malvertising. Let's reduce the risk. Let's also work hard to focus and preserve our concentration because let's face it, ads are just distractions. So there's really no reason for us to see them. It's fine that they continue to exist, but the risk of surveillance and privacy and tracking that we may or may not be asked to consent to is too high. So find a good high quality ad blocker and go ahead and cut those ads right out of your computers and your mobile phones and your tablets, et cetera. Remember, if you can see those ads, they can see you. So that kind of tracking is simply unnecessary. Rule number two, privacy policies are always assumed to be practically worthless. Why? Because so many companies for the past couple of decades have simply said, oh, we need a privacy policy. Well, we'll just copy one from the internet. So they copy one and they post it online. So that means what it says in the privacy policy may not have anything to do with what they actually do to protect your personal data. Remember that every time you visit a website, every time you run an app on your phone, you're sharing information about yourself with a company, okay? And what that company is going to do with that should be very explicitly and completely detailed 
inside that privacy policy. So the question is, can you trust those privacy policies? But there's a couple of ways that you can determine whether you can trust them. One is to Google one and simply take one or two sentences from the privacy policy that you're looking at, place it into a search engine and fire it up and see how many other sites are using those exact same expressions. That should give you an inkling. And secondly, this is something that I myself do. You need to make sure there's somebody else at the other end of the line. At the bottom of every privacy policy, there's a contact. It can be a generic contact or it can be a specific person. Email them and see how long they take to respond. It should just be a couple of days. If you get no response, then that's a clear indication that their privacy practices are lacking. So if you don't see any reason to trust them, then simply do not trust them. Rule number three. Remember to play secret agent. Remember that every time you go online and you find an opportunity to sign up for a program, to get a game, to download a report, to get anything, nowadays you're asked to fill out a form or even to sign up for an account. When you sign up for accounts, they ask you for all kinds of information. And you think to yourself, this is not a doctor's office. Why am I asked to share this information? You shouldn't even have to share your name. Right? Your name is the foundational component of your identity. Why would you need to share it just to get something that's already free? It's clearly not free if you have to exchange your name for it. And if more than just your name is required, then you know there's something going on here and somebody is making money off your data. If that's the case, well, you owe it to yourself to simply either walk away or if you are required to get that free thing, then you're not required to tell the truth. So that's why we say you should consider lying when going to a form that over collects. Data over collection is a violation of privacy law and you need to be the one who says, stop. You're the gatekeeper to your own personal information and what protects your identity is that personal information. That means the more of your personal information you give away, the more of your identity is likely to be copied and the risk of you being impersonated grows. That means if somebody could go out there and pretend to be you and get access to your accounts or to anything that you might have online, that's a bad thing because it's really hard to undo. So it's always good to make sure that you're preventing that kind of exploitation. Right? So rule number four, speaking of abusive things, there's any number of companies that may or may not be legitimate out there. And when you're creating an account on their sites, well, they tell you that it needs to have all these characters and these numbers and all these things, and that's fine. These kinds of rules date back to the 80s when it, you know, people tried to actively guess passwords, just like they do in TV shows, right? That's not how things work today. Nowadays, there are supercomputers. There are literally grids of connected computers that are trying to break passwords over and over again by using hundreds of years, perhaps thousands of years of computing power to crack those passwords. So of course, if your password is eight characters long, it's not gonna last very long. Right. I myself can crack passwords using one of these tools, and I've done it before, in a couple of minutes. So the answer is, any time that you have a discussion about the kinds of passwords you should be adopting, well, it should be long ones. Right? The longer a password is, the more exponentially difficult it becomes to guess these passwords, right? And so, of course, if you're gonna come up with a long password, it's gonna be that much more difficult to remember. So make it easy 
for you to remember and think of it as a sentence. Think of it as a past phrase. So as a past phrase, you're going to have words, you might have punctuation, you might have spacing in it, and it'll be trivial for you to remember, but almost impossible for any computer to guess, and certainly for any other human, unless, of course, you pick a phrase that you're constantly humming on your way to school each day, and somebody might guess that, that you that you probably use that as a passphrase. But do remember never to use that same passphrase on any other account. Again, that is called password reuse, and that is one of the real main reasons for data breaches. That's why so many data breaches occur because people lose their passwords or people hack into one account and then they try that same password on your other accounts. And lo and behold, it works many times. Rule number five, if you see weird password restrictions, be suspicious that the company that's asking you for these things might be putting the onus on you to make sure the password is extra hard to guess so that they do not have, uh, it, so they have an excuse for not encrypting it. So encrypting it means scrambling. It needs to be scrambled as long as they have your password. No company is allowed to have your password. They're only allowed to have the scrambled version of your password. So if any app of or any website is saying, look, select the password to create your account and then you know, enter it again. And they give you uh, enough space to basically make, a, let's say, a certain length password, let's say eight to 16 characters. Well, chances are that you're gonna have a situation where those passwords are gonna be stored in a particular box, in a particular cell, in a spreadsheet on their server. That breaches all kinds of trust norms, and it breaches our rules-based cyber safety order. Why? Because when you scramble and you encrypt a password, no matter what length that password is, it creates something that we call a hash. And it looks like gobbledygook. It looks like a mess, but it's always the same length, right? And that length is something that good computer programs rely on to be able to store passwords in any database. That means if they ask you to select a password, they should ask you to select any password of any length whatsoever, because it'll always be the same length. If a site really cares about you and what length of password you put in, it means it takes your password as it is and dumps it into likely a non-encrypted document. And that breaks the second rule, which is for them not to have access to your password. They should never be able to know what your password is. It should not be visible. If they store it in a list or in a, um, in a spreadsheet, well, they've broken that rule as well. And that's a really big no-no for us. One of the other things that you need to worry about when you're entering new passwords and you're creating new accounts is security questions. Security questions are almost never encrypted. Sure, there are good companies out there that will encrypt the answers to your security questions, right? They ask you, what's your mother's maiden name? What was your first school that you went to? What's your favorite pet? And all this other stuff. There's a good reason not to, not to answer truthfully to those questions. One is because many of them are not encrypted. The other is that many other sites will also have security questions. And those security questions could lead not just on a, to a compromise on those sites, but also on your current site. So come up with a, an answer to these security questions, make sure it's always different. And because you'll need to remember them, of course, you're gonna have to jot it down somewhere. So jot it down in a password management database that you trust and you'll find studies about what's a safe password manager on the KnowledgeFlow website. Be sure to always 
install programs and apps that you trust. So make sure you always revisit those tip sheets on the Knowledge Flow website and see if you can get an inkling or these little tips like these 10 rules that will give you something, something very easy to latch on to that'll make it easier for you to make a decision. Links, for example, are one decision we have to make every day. So rule number six says, you know what? You have the power. When a link comes to you, there's a whole bunch of information that comes with that link. We always think that in a phishing email where somebody tries to fool us into thinking that it's okay to click a link, we always think that the fishers have the advantage. Well, the fishers just have a spam list. They just have your email address. They are hoping that you're gonna click on their link. But the link itself is an indication of potentially where you're gonna go and whether you're likely to get hacked or infected or otherwise compromised. How? Well, there's a couple of things. One, if it comes from a particular company, that link should have the leg legitimate domain name of the company very close to the left side of it, right? So if I receive um, a link from my bank and I bank with my bank, then I expect to see www dot mybank dot com or maybe login dot mybank dot com. What I don't expect to see is mybank dot random domain name dot com. They can use the bank's name before the dot com domain, which we call a top level domain name. They can certainly use it to fool us, but we have to be very vigilant when they do that. We have to understand that we're looking for mybank.com, HTTPS at the beginning, right? And we know this because we are simply hovering over the link, right? If you can't hover over the link, do not go to that link, right? And that's a problem that we have on cell phones, on smartphones. We, it's usually difficult to hover over a link to see where it's gonna go. Sometimes we receive text messages and they say, go to such and such a place, COVID-19 alert. Well, it could be a URL shortener, which is a site that's between you and the actual infected site. It could be uh, something that shortens a very long URL to something short. You have to be careful with URL shorteners and not actually click them. If, because if you can't trust them, then you shouldn't click them. One thing that I sometimes do is I take that URL and I stick it into a search engine. Let the search engine deal with it and see where it, where it goes. Obviously, other times I hover above it to see where it goes. And some URL shorteners, you should know, will tell you where it goes if you simply add a plus to the actual link. It's a little bit more difficult there because you have to copy the link paste it carefully into your browser without pressing enter, then adding a plus and then pressing enter. That's a little bit more complicated, but if you're grokking things this far, it shouldn't be too difficult for you to do. All we need to remember here is that you have a lot of information in a link. And as long as you don't click it, you continue to be safe no matter what it says around that link, no matter how urgent the message around that URL is going to be. So it's a lot of fun. There are websites out there uh, like urlscan.io, which will help you see if a link is legit. URL scan is exactly what it says. You drop the link into it and it investigates it for you. Sometimes it, you'll be the first one to have submitted it, right? And that's fine. Just because it doesn't say that it's infected doesn't mean it isn't. But there's a number of other pieces of information that will give you about that link that'll help you, help you make a decision. So lots of fun to be had is where we're going with this, right? So why not have fun with scammers if they're having fun with us? Just don't interact with them, right? There's no point in trying to waste their time because anytime you do that, you're still giving them 
some information, right? So that's why we never reply to messages. If you didn't initiate that conversation, well, don't bother. Don't necessarily delete it. What I do is I drag that message and I put it into a folder called sketchy messages. And sometimes I use it in my presentations, just like this one. And other times I'll look at it when I have time. And other times I will right click it and see what makes it tick. And I'll look to see where it's coming from. But whenever you see urgency in a message, just take it as a sign that you should take a step back, think about it twice, three times, maybe ask somebody else to have a look at it, but do not respond to it, okay? So again, if you're still with me here, one of the first questions that I ask my students anytime we start a new class is, what is the opposite of security? The opposite of security is not insecurity. It's not a lack of security. The opposite of security is convenience. Anytime you try to skip steps, and streamline a process, you have to think, what am I losing here? I have some choices to make that allow me to determine whether each step in a process is the safe step to take. But if I reduce an entire process from X number of steps to one or two, then I'm likely to lose something in, uh, in that process. So think about clickbait like hidden traps. Think about any product that says, hey, you know, this is a smart TV or this is a smart service or cloud system. Why did they create a cloud-based website when they could have made a little program that just runs on your computer? Well, in the case of cloud systems, usually they pick up a lot of information from users. They know exactly when you're logging in, who you are, and so on. They will also know if you're a hacker or not. So there may be legitimate uses. In the case of smart TVs, they certainly learn a lot about their viewers and their interests. But the fact that some viewers don't really understand just how much gets recorded and for some devices to have cameras on them and microphones on them and so on, it's not reasonable to have a document called terms of service or privacy policy and in it to have buried some legalese, some tiny, tiny print that says, and by the way, we are collecting and storing some of this information to learn more about you and our partners will help us do that. That's not okay. So make sure you fully understand what a smart device does how much data it collects, and always ask the question, how long do you keep my information and the information that you learn from me? Because that will be an enlightening conversation. Most often they will say, well, most often they'll say nothing. As we said, when you write to somebody a contact from your privacy policy, most often they won't respond but sometimes they will. And it's always interesting because you're learning from professionals. And in many cases, you've got dedicated professionals that you can talk to and you can ask them questions. That's their job, right? I'm a privacy officer and a security officer for many organizations. And I always enjoy it when people write, even out of the blue and ask a question, right? It's always an opportunity to share information, just like you will hopefully do as a result of our presentation today. So make sure that you ask about, hey, you know what, if I buy this TV and plug it in, am I likely to be on somebody else's TV going forward? Is somebody else going to watch me literally or figuratively? So keep your guard up. Make sure that you understand that anytime you make things easier, anytime you get into a car and that car tries to think about what your next music preference might be, or tries to learn about you, or tries to actively listen to you so as to be ready to do whatever you wanted to do, uh, chances are there's a little bit too much surveillance involved. And we all have to remember that what we're trying to protect here is our personal identity.
right? We own the information and we should decide individually and incrementally how much of that information we're going to be sharing and with whom and for how long, right? These are questions that you should always ask. And remember, rule number nine is really about sharing this kind of information with authorities. If you go to the Knowledge Flow website, you'll find a list of tons of authoritative government agencies and organizations that will help you with the kinds of reports that you have. Whenever you file a report, be sure to always say, and by the way, is there any other organization I should be notifying? This is helpful because in some cases, somebody will read your report and say, you know what, I'm going to have to think about that. But if you say, and by the way, is there anybody else I can loop in? They'll respond more quickly and they'll say, oh yeah, there's this other maybe law enforcement agency that might be able to help. So little tricks like that will make it easier for you to feel like you have control because it's so easy for us on a daily basis to say, you know what, I'm flooded with all of these things. I have to deal with privacy invasions and potentially security breaches. There's nobody here to help me. And I can't find anybody who even understands what I'm saying, but there's a solid structure of support that does exist. And in many cases, you can flag some of these things. You can go on social media. We all have social media accounts, well, most of us anyway, and we can use hashtags, hashtags like the one on the first page of this presentation. Not on my internet is a way to fight back. It's a little bit of micro resistance, and it's a way to say, you know what? Yeah, that's not gonna fly with me, right? Or my friends, right? I can't give you access to my computer. I'm not going to share my password. I'm not going to overshare personal information. And on top of everything, I'm going to report what I think is a privacy practice that is not fair. Because I don't think it's fair to me to have to share my home address if I'm just downloading a free document online. So think about that. Because many people who are super aware simply don't have the time and they simply click delete. Well, at the very least, send it to someone who cares. And maybe they'll create a course like this one out of it. Or maybe you can use it to teach your class and your, if you're at work, your colleagues, right? Your classmates would love to learn something from you. And because you're now a cyber safety champion, you can do these things, right? So. It's important to remember that in order to stay unhackable, we need a team. You got to have a crew. You got to have people you talk to. This is what we've been talking about, right? So if you're going to be unhackable, you need to not just help others, but rely on others as well. Find an outlet. Use social media. Use those hashtags to expose what you see as being unfair practices. And if anyone abuses your personal information or your identity, it's likely that they're doing that to others. So why not put a couple of words together and share them? And for sure, definitely share them with us at the Knowledge Flow Foundation, Canada's Cyber Safety Foundation. And with that, thank you very much for listening and for watching and enjoy cyber day it's certainly a pleasure for us to see you year year in year out so we'll see you soon bye bye